Welcome to today's Tech Talk podcast. Where we're here to talk about 3D printing, and I'm sure some of you here have read some about it, about the industry, and how we may be expecting a new industrial revolution. Um, the 3D printing was actually invented in the late uh, 1970s, but usually, or originally, just used by engineers to create prototypes. Uh, now, however, it's becoming more and more commercialized, uh, being used in homes, and one of the companies that have done the best job in customizing oh. and making this a commercial product is Makey Labs. Yeah, so today we're extremely privileged to have Alice Taylor, the founder and CEO of Makey Labs, <coughs> come and speak to us about her company and her perspective on the future of 3D printing. And Alice has been uh, involved for 16 years with building digital products for Channel 4, BBC, Nickelodeon, Warner Brothers, and more, and mostly aimed at children and teens. And uh, her company, Makey Lab, uh, they make highly customized 3D printed dolls, is the one you can see there. And uh, these toys are remarkable because purely, of, so let's start with their design. I mean, they're, uh, you design it online, and then it may, gets made and customly tailored to you and shipped to you. And also, these dolls exist in a virtual accompanying world within apps. Uh, and uh, this company is a global leader in mass customized 3D printing and has uh, received a number, of, uh, a number of accolades, such as uh, being named one of the London's hottest startups by Wire Magazine and, welding the, and winning the Accelerator Prize from South by Southwest in gaming and entertainment. And we're also very privileged to have, privileged to have Matt here, who will be speaking to Alice. Matt is the director of media at Nelson Ballstock Communications and uh, he was formerly the European tech correspondent for Reuters TV and responsible f uh, is responsible for many of the large articles in Wired UK. And Matt has interviewed many of uh, the tech sector's most influential figures. This is one of our favorite tech writers. And after the event, we'd also like to point out that we'll have a little get together at the Rotary Bar where we'll have some conversations over drinks and we'll, we'll get the first round. So you should definitely join us. All right, <laughs> and over to you, Matt. Can you hear me? Yeah. Sort of. Um, thanks a lot, guys. It's great to be here. Uh, thanks to Alice for joining me. Uh, I'll just say a few words uh, about me before we start this. I covered technology for Reuters TV for eight years, uh, and I lived in Shoreditch for a little while. Before it was called Silicon Roundabout and then Tech City, uh, I think it was Shoreditch, Shoreditch Triangle at the time. Mm -hmm. And I had this great honor of, of interviewing people about change and about new things. One of the coolest things that I ever had a chance to do in, in that role was to interview Peter Ackroyd on the, um, just in front of the Millennium Bridge, and he talked about the city of London. And he said that London is a city that's always sloughing off its own skin. Basically, you know, getting rid of the new, and getting rid of the old, and embracing the new. And I, I think that Makey is probably one of the best examples of this. It's, based here in East London uh, on Scretton Street, not too far from uh, where, where Shakespeare had his first London theaters. It's a lot of pressure, I know, a lot to live up to. But there's this incredible thing that's happening uh, in East London where you have new manifestations of creativity in a place where some of the most creative media of all time uh, started, originated. So with that, I'm going to turn to Alice, uh, and uh, as I say, no pressure. When I, when I first heard about Makey Lab, it was um, a science fiction author by the name of Cory Doctorow was telling me about his wife oh, who had quit her job <laughs> at Channel 4 to start a business making 3D printed dolls. And I thought, that sounds cool. And I also thought, that sounds crazy. <laughs> so what possessed you? What, what made you think that there was a business in this? Ah, uh, um, the fact that dolls sell. So that was, I've never had to argue whether there's um, a business in toys of any kind, right? So these are customizable toys on demand, which does flip the model of existing toys, but they're also dolls. And dolls is the biggest selling toy category, um, and kind of always has been. Construction toys are second. 
So, you know, at the end of the day, we pitched up with an idea that was, hey, let's make some dolls, but let's make them here, let's make them on demand, and let's make them each individually unique to their owner instead of mass-produced, made in China, and, you know, four years from concept to shelf. But you had a job job, like, you I know, you were, you, were, you were an executive at Channel 4. <laughs> uh, you I know, had a sure well-paid job. Yeah, yeah, you had I a decent salary, <laughs> and, you, and you turned your back on that to say, yeah. hey, let's, uh, let's print some, I mean, it was unproven. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you believed. What was the vision then that made you decide it was time? And also, I should say that Joe was with you, right? Joe Roach was um, one of the she, other co-founders. So, well, I went and got her. So, so the way, the, what happened was, so my background is in games, and the idea came to me. This is, if you've ever seen me talk, you will have heard this because I tell it over and over and over. But the idea came to me in 2010. So in 2009, Corey wrote this book. In this book, um, there are some characters who hack toys using all sorts of cool things like Arduino and stuff like that. And that was clearly kind of lodging in my brain. But at the time, Corey and I were visiting Fab Labs and seeing 3D printers. So I knew about 3D printing and stuff from about 2008 onwards, I'm guessing. And then in 2010, I was at this conference called Digital Kids uh, for part of my work at Channel 4. So that's where I would go and hang out with people doing virtual worlds and games for kids. And we would talk digital stuff. And for the first time in 2010, they had co-located Digital Kids with the New York Toy Fair. And the New York Toy Fair is basically the biggest toy fair, pretty much, I think, in the world. Mm -hmm. And it is a giant uh, production that kind of takes over half of New York. And so here we were, and the digital stuff was all in the basement, and the physical stuff was all upstairs. And they were co-located, but still separated by two kind of, mm -hmm. you know, a long distance of corridors and fire doors, but also just emotionally separated. And uh, I was downstairs, and I, I think it was Michael Acton Smith from Moshi, but it could have been the guy from Club Penguin. But anyway, this guy had got off stage, and he'd just been talking about his virtual world that sold virtual goods and had 50 million kids in it. And um, this guy at the back who'd come down from the toy fair, and you could tell because he was a lot older, but he had all the <laughs> gear on. And he was like, all this screen-based business. Don't you just want kids to go outside and play with a hoop and a stick? And it was one of those moments where it was like, that genie, there no longer needs to be that separation. If a kid goes out, yes, you want them to go outside, and they probably will, and they might have a screen in their pocket, and then they mm. might bring the stick back in and start bashing things inside the house. I mean, why separate mm. them, right? Let them blend. And, and then I was like, so why can't you make dolls out of avatars? And so I went upstairs, dinosaurs out of dinosaurs, cars out of cars. I went upstairs and had a look at all the toys. And walked this giant floor and it was just piles of the same sort of thing. So it was like books, plushies, dolls, construction, books, plushies, dolls, construction, just all the way around, 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 around. And like one mention of Twitter and I think three mentions of Facebook in, you know, tens of thousands of square feet in 2010. I was like, holy crap, this is a, an analog business. Right. And downstairs is the digital business and can we bridge them with physical, digital, technology. But so, yeah. mass production kind of works on a scale, on a yeah. financial scale. You yeah. built a prototype and it cost how much? 200,000 pounds. 200,000? Yeah. So that's wow. more than you think. So to a lot of people that's like, holy shit, that's a lot of money. For me. For building, <laughs> for building physical stuff yeah. or even top end digital stuff. Yeah. It was not that much money. Like okay. a lot of the game projects at Channel 4 were kind of a minimum spend of about 250. Uh, and the more expensive ones are kind of 750. And obviously, bigger games have millions and millions and millions. Right. Um, so, what we built was a digital demo, but also a manufacturing pipeline demo and the physical demo. Right. And then we went and raised the real money to actually build a team. You took a bit of a digital approach to building this business, though, right? Because we, you've been very candid that the first versions were not the cutest, cuddliest dolls on Earth. That's right. Well, so the vision, going back, because I didn't quite answer the question, the vision was virtual goods that produce physical goods. So we set up as a games company that would produce toys. And when I went out to raise the money, a lot of people were like, well, which one is it? Are you a games company or are you a toys company? Because you can't be both. We're like, no, no, you don't get it. We are both. There has to be both. It's kind of the point is that you take a 3D mesh from a game and you build the software in order to make that 3D mesh into a 3D product. Mm -hmm. How do you separate that? Well, no, you've got to choose one or the other. So I went around and found the VCs and type of people who weren't quite that like black and white about the whole thing. Um, and 
so, so we set up as the Toys and Games thing. And then with that bit of money, what happened was, was actually when we went round, people said, well, we also get that you can make a game. Like, we can see lots of games of virtual goods that exists. But 3D printed consumer facing products, they don't really exist. So, um, and plus, you guys, you're not manufacturers, right? So by this point, I'd found my co-founder. So I quit my job, um, gone and approached Joe, my COO, and Silka, the CDO. We'd gone and, um, and basically said, come and, come and join this crazy idea. Mm -hmm. And uh, But Joe's background is in digital media. Silka's <coughs> background, he built Habbo Hotel. Luke, our CTO at the time, he was um, the guy who did the tools for Little Big Planet. So all digital people. Mm -hmm. So basically, we got given the money, but we also had to prove that it could happen. So we built a demo and put it live. And we started to sell physical product. So at that point, it was like, OK, so we can do it, right? This can be done. Although what you can't see is this is string and cellar tape. And the dolls themselves were bone white, uh, not toy safe, et cetera. So, uh, but we left it live. And so we're doing live product development. Were you plugged into the maker culture from, from the very beginning? I mean, because you've, you've benefited from their support. They've helped yeah. you actually shape the product in some yeah. cases. Um, yeah, I would say yes. I mean, I'm a huge, huge fan of maker culture uh, and the maker scene and maker fair and make magazine. Um, but did you know that? Did you know that you could rely on that <coughs> in the early days? Well, so to be honest, no. And I, I'm not sure, like when you say rely on it, that's really interesting because when we set out again, when we said toys and games and we're going to use 3D printing, immediately people thought, oh, kids will print their own toys at home, right? Yeah. And we were like, no, because actually, even though that's the narrative of you know, there'll be a 3D printer on every desk. It hasn't happened yet, and it's not going to happen for mm -hmm. a while. So if you were going to try and build a commercial business on expecting your consumers or customers to be able to print at home, at the moment, you're talking like a couple of thousand. Right. People. You had to have faith, I guess is my point, right? Yeah. But so at the same time, we were like, well, the cool stuff about maker culture is the democratization of access to tech. And, and that kind of, let's have a go. Right. I'm not a trained person in this, but I can Google. Okay. And so let's do that. And so that's the kind of maker culture that we want to encourage that, and especially in kids, is that idea of um, A, you can make your own toy, but you can make the clothes to go on your toy, and then you can make the furniture to go around it. And then, hell, you can make some electronics to stick in it and turn it into a robot, and then you can put it in a car. And in fact, why don't you take it onto a ro rocket and send it to the moon? That kind of thing, just to like not just limit it down to playing with dolls, but to actually just kind of open up and go, make everything. So that initial vision, I'll get, get off this in a second, but was it, was it to take on Mattel? Was it, was it, was it to, what was the, what was the big goal So yeah, on the when, very you, first when you day? build your business plan and you go and do your, your 10 deck, 30 point, whatever, what is it, 30 minutes, 20 point time, I don't know, 10 I'm not slides. the one who started a business. Yeah. So when you do that, oh, those are 15 slides, yeah. um, you have to show uh, ambition, you have to do the maths. Right. So obviously we looked at Mattel and Hasbro and folks like that, but we also looked at people like EA and we looked at the maker culture and the emergence of um, accessible 3D printing. Mm -hmm. but yeah, so I mean Mattel, American Girl is a kind of customizable doll in the sense that what they've done is brute force the problem. So there's actually 40 dolls that you can choose from that look kind of like you. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's a 400 or probably like half a billion dollar now business a year for Mattel mm -hmm. in the States only. Um, so we were like, well, that's $109 for an American girl and you can sort of customize it. That kind of proves the market that there's a, a market for expensive semi-customizable dolls. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> so that works. So yeah. Works so that, for you. Yeah, you can do that kind of um, So in the introduction, it was mentioned that uh, there's a lot of talk about 3D printing right now. Oh. And it, it's often followed by the sentence, the new industrial revolution. This yeah. is a book that was written by Chris Anderson. It came out last year. Uh, Chris is the former editor of Wired in the U.S. Um, really, really interesting, good yeah. book. But uh, when we've spoken, you have not necessarily been as convinced that it will stand up to the scrutiny of, of driving through uh, a new industrial revolution, or won't, it won't um, deliver on that promise. No, I totally believe it can. Um, but what I try to do is just to slightly balance in some cases, there's been a little bit of frothing at the mouth mm -hmm. when it comes to 3D printing, not least because when you actually see it in action half the time, it is fucking amazing, right? So, and I swear on purpose there, because a lot of people 
can't believe their eyes. And so inevitably they go, right. well, we can print houses on the moon. Right. And that's when you start to go, well, 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 yes, but like it's going to take 30 years, not two. Right. So, so there's just an element of that. So, no, I mean, I, I believe in it completely. So I, feel, I felt the same way about 3D printing when I actually went and researched it properly. I felt the same way as I did when I kind of first got in the net in 94, 5, whatever, and saw Netscape 1 and then viewed Source and started building websites. And it was like, this changes everything. Right. And so I do feel that it does change everything not so much in the sense of oh can i print my own iphone no you can't print your own iphone you're still going to manufacture iphones but can you make something that you want to make maybe right, right. what it right. what it means is that anybody in this room can go and make an object and previously you couldn't do that right so going back to the 200k thing let's, let's talk about let's use toys as an, as an example so if you had an idea for a doll you would not be able to go and make it unless you happen to have a hundred thousand pounds to spend on molds and access to a factory just to produce the first kind of working product. Mm -hmm. And then you'd have to run off a series of five, 10, 15, whatever, how many thousand, and you'd have to have a deal with your retailer and you'd have to have it in your warehouse and you'd have to have that whole thing set up before you could even find out whether you're able to sell your thing, mm -hmm. right? Whereas now, you, that, that goes away. It just goes away. And what is the opportunity for London? This is probably the point where I should read this quote. So I, I'm, this, this is, uh, there are two books called Makers. Uh, this is the, the one, as I say, that was written by Chris, but he, They're friends. he, he references uh, Corey's uh, book in it, uh, which I think is the beginning of this, where he says, the days of companies with names like General Electric and General Mills and General Motors are over. The money on the table is like a krill, a billion little entrepreneurial opportunities that can be discovered and exploited by smart, creative people. I mean, London is a place where, you know, we don't have a lot of manufacturing left, right? No. In the UK. No, in not really. Live here. Um, I think we probably have more than everybody realizes, but it's not the um, uh, Eisenbard Kingdom Brunel days right. anymore. But it's a, it's a creative culture. Yeah, So hugely. What do you think? I mean, Two percent of exports. <laughs> you know the stats. <laughs> um, do you do you feel like you're the big, uh, obviously there's a maker movement, but do you do you think that you are the at the start of a, a new sort of three D printing movement movement here? Well, so again, what this does is it means that if you want to manufacture something, you don't have to go to China, and there's nothing wrong with China. Well, there's a there's a lot wrong in the shipping and the but like in principle. You can get to China really easily now through things like Alibaba, but now again, you don't have to. So um, we print in London and Amsterdam. I think it just means that London's always had a history of, well, some history of manufacturing and engineering. What's really gutting is the building in front of my flat. I live behind Old Street roundabout, and the building, I've been there for years, and the building in front of my flat is being yanked down, and it's an old toy factory, and oh. they're knocking it down to make fancy pants student residences. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, we're in a, in a light industrial building up the road, which has got a good concrete floor, so we're allowed to have machines in it and make a mess. Okay. And so we can put machines in now. Like, that's mm -hmm. awesome. Whereas previously, you'd, you'd, I think when you think of a factory, you think of a giant room full of stuff, whereas now we have, like, a distributed manufacturing network where there's one machine here and there's one machine over there and there's one machine over there and they're all doing the same thing, but they're... Networked. Cool. All right, so we'll move forward a little bit. It's been a big year for you. You've been out to LA hanging out with Will I Am. Uh, uh, Joe Roche, the co founder, gave uh, a couple dolls to um, Prince Harry and the Prime Minister in New York and you got in the papers and yeah. on the news. Uh, you're in Selfridges, uh, yeah. selling dolls in Selfridges, and of course, uh, the third hottest startup in, in London. Yeah. So do, do you no feel like you, you've hit a uh, an inflection point, or do you feel like this, this has been a turning point for you? Um, yes. I mean, yes. So, very much so. Uh, so basically, any time somebody mentions 3D printing, the phone starts ringing um, slightly inevitably. But at the same time, we actually don't consider ourselves out of alpha yet. Right? We, we're a software company. We're, we're doing live iteration. And uh, if the launch last summer was the demo, we got toy safety in February of this year, and then we put an app out in March, and the game's coming out in January, and we went into Selfridges in August. So we're just kind of doing all these things, that, you know, along a, a sort of line. And I would consider the product to be a beta 
once the game is out and has been iterated on for about six months, so mm -hmm. kind of this time next year towards the run-up of next Christmas. So what's weird about it is we're visible. We're doing it in front of everybody. Right? Right. So when Mattel created Monster High, it took four years, I'm told, from concept to shelf. Total secrecy until bang, out it comes with 50 million mm -hmm. marketing budget or whatever. And Lego Friends took four years to make as well. And we're kind of like, we've gone from demo to Selfridges in kind of just over a year, but ordinarily it would be secret. Mm -hmm. So all of the things that have kind of gone wrong or broken is completely public, which right. is hilarious. Does that kind of vulnerability, do you think, help you in some yeah. way? Yeah! Come on! <laughs> because I, I covered the Raspberry Pi, and I know when they when yeah. they launched, they they thought they were going to sell like ten thousand at most, and they yeah. sold like one point um, seven million. Exactly. No. So this goes back to the maker thing. So definitely having that vulnerability and having that sort of Shh, look out. Do you want to kind of join in with this? Um, early adopters come along, and they really like that. Uh, the yeah. downside, obviously, although we've yet to see this, but this is what everybody worries about. You know, every time I speak to an investor, they're like, well, aren't you worried that Mattel is just going to come along and copy you? Right. Well, what am I supposed to do about that anyway? Right. I mean, you know, it's Are like, you worried about that? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, Asda this week, I, I read that Asda oh, is allowing gosh. people Should to be, get them place, their, themselves scanned and 3D printed for 40 pounds. Yeah. Well, I think this is the thing. Like, if you're going to worry about Mattel copying you, so A, I've worked in big corporations and I know how they work and they're yeah. not fast, yeah. usually. But B, if somebody's going to copy you, so this is the same thing of like, well, aren't you going to patent everything? No. Because, like, what am I supposed to do if Mattel come along and go, yeah, we're just going to do it as well? What, what I'm going to sue them? Yeah. So it, it doesn't work that way. I, th I personally believe that if you, um, the, the most important thing that you can garner is, is attention and love from your customers and grow it like that. And then if somebody tries to come along and copy you or whatever, you've got, you've got that as your little, that's a defensive system, that's a protective, caring system. The patent system doesn't give a shit. Right. So, you know, and I'm not, I'm, I don't mean that in a really venal way, I just mean genuinely, like it makes business sense. It, it, as a startup, as a small startup, you can't wake up every morning going, oh, Mattel are going to copy us. We've got to, we, what are we going to do? Right. Because otherwise you'd never get anything done. <laughs> um, this is an extraordinary looking doll. And I know this because we have one at our house. Um, my, my daughter has two makeys. She has uh, an awesome nerd kid. Thanks, she's, yeah. She's, brilliant. she's She's almost seven. Uh, and we went to see the, wire, uh, the makey store. It uh, uh, was part of the Wired pop-up in December. Uh, and she asked for Makey, and they're like, they're a bit expensive. <laughs> but I, I was really proud of her for, for wanting it. Gotcha. And, and, she, and she designed it. So I sat with my daughter, who's then <laughs> six, uh, and she designed her own doll on the computer, and it was just, it was amazing. So the incredibly so, painful thing about it is we're making pennies on them as well. Right. right. So this is, again, part of the beta thing. And Again, that's a classic example. I probably shouldn't admit that in public. But the reason they're highly priced is because they cost a fortune to make yeah. compared to the whole business of upfront and then each doll. So I was told the other day that Barbie spends more on packaging, Mattel, spends more on packaging the doll than the doll. Right. Like literally the paper and plastic costs more than the, than the product at this point. Um, and it's the opposite for us. So. ABS plastic is about five euros a kilo, and the powdered nylon that goes through the 3D printers to make these is 90 mm -hmm. euros a kilo. So just on a basic materials cost, it's way, mm -hmm. way, way higher. Mm -hmm. um, but again, going back to the business model is we knew that because we'd done the research at the front, and the business was always going to, that we designed, that we're still looking at and hoping is going to come about, is that we have a digital product that produces virtual goods for sale, that produces also physical goods for sale, and it was always supposed to be kind of 70-30. So it's like we're still running on fumes and other people's money, mm -hmm. but like the, the model Don't worry, will web, be Don't worry, web businesses do it all the time. Even Twitter is not totally. making Totally. I mean, that's, why uh, you, that's, that's what you do, yeah, right? This yeah. is risk capital for that exact reason. Nobody right. has done this before. Right. So we had to figure it out. And, and like I said, we're doing it quite publicly. But so yeah, I wanted to ask like you about... Could, it wasn't like we could do a fast follow or any of that right. fun stuff. Well, okay, you never know. Company. When, when you, you know you're going to be really taking off when the Sandberg brothers launch their uh, yeah, making exactly. clone. Um, so they have color now. They have color mm. and they have uh, um, increasingly trendy outfits. Mm. Yeah, we're getting better and better I, at that. I know a lot about this doll. Um, <laughs> and uh, when, I, when I first met you, you were, you were dipping 
uh, heads in tea That's right, and we onions. Boiling them in PG tips. Yeah. So, so yeah, so 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 the powder that comes out of the printer is bone white. And uh, obviously, when they first came out, they were bone white like this, kind of creepy looking. Yeah. And um, extra creepy looking, I should say. And uh, we were like, well, what do we do? So you can't put, pad you can't put colored powder into the printers because once a color is in, it never comes out. Right? So, um, so we were looking around for suppliers who were willing to brick their computer and put some colors in, and we couldn't find any. So OK, so it has to be post-processed. It, again, it's one of those things where that knowledge is still emerging, right? So we looked around and I said, how do you dye this stuff? And somebody said, oh, Dylon. So I took a doll home and stuck it in the washing machine with a packet of Dylon. And it didn't work. And it came out. It hadn't taken. I was like, and so we went around, and, you know, looked around. And then it turns out, oh, actually, you need industrial Dylon, which you have to buy in <laughs> Germany. And no. but, but by this point, we were like, well, what else can we chuck in the washing machine type right. thing? So we did PG tips, and that produced a fairly decent Caucasian. We did blueberry and saffron and, and coffee and all sorts of stuff. It was like mud and water pie at one point. I mean, it was just ridiculous. It ink, you know, just kind of anything with any yeah. kind of vaguely skin color-y stuff. Uh, and the tea was good, but then by this point, the, the dyes folk had kind of caught up with us, and we spoke to somebody, and they said, no, no, here's the range of industrials. So we got pale brown, medium brown, and dark brown. And unfortunately, with Dylon, uh, the pale brown comes out kind of pinky, and the dark brown comes out nice and brown, but the light medium brown comes out green. <laughs> <laughs> so we were like, oh, that's a bit odd. And then we were like, well, you know, Maybe some people want green. <laughs> <laughs> so we left it in. Yeah. They do have pointy ears after all. Right. If you want to make an elf, you can make an elf. And yeah. meanwhile, we're still working. So now we've got two more browns, which are just about to come online. And then we've also got some fun colors. We've got like pink and orange and yellow and stuff like that coming out as well. So the, the kind of options will just carry on. It sounds like a fun job. So you're coming out with even cuter makeys. Yeah. That is, this sounds like a strange question, but what's the business rationale behind that? So um, the, we've been selling a lot to adults and some kids, kind of 60-40. Right. But the doll market is a kid-based market. There is a large collector's market, um, but the, the avatar-based big-headed collector's market is in Japan and Korea, and so you really need to be based there, or at least fluent in that language, ideally, to go and do business. I mean, I can't mm. really rock up in Japan and go, hi, and just start doing business, because I don't speak the language. So, and then the uh, American collector doll market is the pin-headed celebrity doll stuff. So that's all Princess Diana and Michelle Obama. Um, you can knock you know, off one or two of those, no? Well, yeah, we, did, we managed Cameron, so. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah that's true. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but we were looking at those, and. Either way, there's not, you'd have to kind of be really specific to build a business there. The, the, the big business is in 0 to 12, mostly, well, no, it's not mostly female, actually. It's just 0 to 12. Mm -hmm. So dolls are generally for girls, and action figures are generally for boys. So mm -hmm. we made action dolls. Cool. <laughs> and the price will be the same or lower? No, the price is going to come down. So the price is, a, again, it's a factor of the now. So it's a factor of the price of materials, the um, price of the machines. So the, mm. the printer that we print on costs 150,000 euros, and the big one is 500,000 euros. Right. But most of the key patents in those machines are going to expire next year. So when you go back to FDM, which is the squeezing plastic out of a nozzle, the maker bots, of the, there's mm -hmm. like 500 different types of kind of $2,000 desktop printer. That stuff was patented you know, seven years ago or so. It came out of patent. Uh, Professor Boyer down at Portsmouth, I think it was, anyway, Adrian Boyer, of the RepRap, he kind of looked at it and went, I can duplicate that now and stick it open source, which he did, mm -hmm. and that's why there are 500 FDMs. So the same needs to happen for the powder-based stuff. So for those that don't know, there's kind of three main types of 3D printing. There's the extrusion type, where you get a kind of ridged effect. Um, but it's cheap and tearful because it's ABS or PLA. Mm -hmm. There's liquid, which is resin cured, UV cured resin usually. You get super, super detail, but it's kind of only in yellow or whatever, like kind of urine yellow. And it's good for things like architects. And use then that. there's the powdered nylon or powdered gypsum sort of stuff, which is the full color stuff. Yeah. And that produces a really nice uh, just object 
quality, but specifically the nylon is toy safe. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, hopefully with the powder-based stuff, as soon as those key patents are out of the way, we'll see the same sort of proliferation okay. over the next five years. So it's Where was I going with well, this? Well, no, no, I asked you a question and you were answering it. What was the it. question? It was about the cost. It was about making cuter dolls so at a lesser price. I'm wondering if there's like a Moore's Law effect There here. should be. So with the MakerBot, um, which is now like $2,000, uh, it, that was $70,000 10 right. years ago. Right. So um, there's a similar powder-based printer called the Blue Printer, which is just about to come out, which is $10,000. So that right. process is happening. So we're like poised I to see. kind of benefit from that. And then anyway, you, you start saving money with scale because you can buy the powder at bulk. You can run the clothes off at a factory instead of doing them individually and stuff like that. So you're also moving into other areas as well. A game, um, the narrative, if you can talk about that. Yeah. So t tell me about the game, because you've come from you know, digital media and make in that world, you've gone into physical products and 3D printing. Why are you now going back into games? So the games never went away. So the, the way you make a makey is through basically what we call Doll Builder, but it's an app. Um, and it, we use Unity to build, which is an engine piece of middleware, and it exports to the kind of not so good Flash version on the web. Plus, we've got the iOS app at the moment, and then the game will come out. Now, going back to the 70-30, the, the digital physical thing, um, the game is supposed to be the beginning of why you would create a makey other than you can. Right? So there's the types of customer who's going to come along and go, oh, I can make my own. That's really awesome. Um, but then there's another big group of customers who kind of need a story world to, to and this is really specific to kids as well. Okay. There's a kind of story world that they want to be part of. Like, why do you want to be? What is a makey? Right? So right. I found out the other day, somebody said, why do you think there are so many Batman toys and no Superman toys? I don't know. Batman's things are all externalities. So you can role play Batman because you just need the belt and the car and the cape and you're Batman. Right. Because right? he's just a human, but he's got all this cool gear. Yeah. His parents Superman were killed when is he was internalized. A kid, yeah, if you're not, if, yeah, exactly. Superman's powers come from magic. Right. So you can't, you can't, you put on a cape, but you're not Superman. And it's that thing. So why do you want to role play being a makey? So yeah, we need to bring in the narrative and we need to bring in the kind of essence of what a makey is. So the game is about making. But that's creative. I mean, that's going to take more of your time, more creativity. You're going to throw some money so at it. Time. Yeah. Yeah, it's taken a lot of time. And to be honest, you know, it's not World of Warcraft. It's, it's like a really simple little game. But it's right. taken a lot of time. But what it is is a, a resource management game. So you're going <coughs> to grow materials right. like cotton plants and rabbits for Angora. And then you're going to take the materials and take them into your workshop and put them through your machines. And that will produce textiles. And you've got a little 3D printer in there. And you can put your rubber in the 3D printer. And you can make buttons and stuff. And then you can draw on the textiles to make um, clothes with cloth on. And then in your dress-up room, you get to show off what you've made and then show off to each other and kind of make stuff for each other and this and the other. The difference being that we can also, in the future, uh, not that far in the future, kind of next week. Uh, <laughs> Are you launching this next do, week? No, as in we've got the, the okay. concept coming back. Oh, okay, okay. Um, but the game needs to come out first, which is in January, and then we'll do the, the texturizer stuff kind of next summer. But where I'm going with this is you'll be able to doodle on the cloth, but we will then be able to print those doodles onto a real cloth and send it out as a clothing kit wow. to make. So not only have you drawn on your digital avatar, but you also have physical version of clothing and doll. So, so Mr. Mashi should watch out. No, Mr. Mashi's perfectly safe. Um, Mashi, the, the, the biggest change actually for Mashi is that they really need to scramble to get onto mobile. Mm -hmm. So kids, the tablet has just overtaken the console as the most popular computing platform right. for kids. And that's before this Christmas. So like the tablet is it, that's it, right? That's their thing. And it's going to be majority Android, although they will want the I, iOS version, but they'll get Android. And, um, and they'll be happy with it. <laughs> uh, Alice lives in an Apple-free household. I do. We're an anti-Apple household. Uh, um, but the thing about Moshi is, um, so they've got the characters, and they, they just need to get onto the tablet. But interestingly, a lot of people have said, why don't you do 3D printing? Why don't you work with Moshi or whatever, something like that. The thing about toys, the hardest thing in Toyland yeah. is, other than money, 
Other than money, I don't know, coming up with the concepts. The I hardest think. thing? Toys, any toys? Painting, painting toys. Really? Totally done by hand. So Isn't is that this, ridiculous? Is this painted? Skyland is a hand painted, that's hand painted. Yeah. But the great thing about a humanoid is that you only need to do a little bit. <laughs> this is why we haven't done Gundam. Oh, I see. Right. Okay. So, like, Skylanders are hand painted. Um, you know, you name it, they're hand painted. At best, they might have a kind of tampo thing where they've, because if it's a million of the same thing, you can sort of stamp out some stuff. But, like, Skylanders, ladies in China, hand painting stuff. So, Moshi, you look at that, it's like 2,000 little characters that are basically differentiated only by color. Yeah. So. Yeah. But Mashi really took off when, when they moved into physical goods. I mean, it, it yes, was, it was very popular yeah. beforehand, but it really changed yeah. things for them. So I'm yeah. wondering, you're kind of starting in the physical gaming so world you, and then you, moving into digital. Yeah, so they grew. I mean, what they did, if you want to scrape it back to bare bones, what Moshi did was they created a narrative universe, right. and they started with games. And that's popular with kids. And so they became popular with kids. Mm -hmm. Like, equally, there are lots of people who start a narrative universe, and they do it on telly. That's also popular with kids. Right. So, you know, Peppa Pig or Octonauts, pretty big. And also doing that kind of multi. But basically what you do is if you create the sort of, oh, I hate calling it this, but they do call it property, you, you should think, well, is this a game, a comic, a book, a, you know, a toy or whatever, whatever, whatever. And in fact, most people are now thinking about how they can do all of that. So I was at MIP Junior this week and the Mattel lady was there and she was talking about Monster High and she was like, this is what Monster High was at launch. And it was a website and animated series on YouTube and um, the DVD was in planning and there were two mobile games and they had the kind of backpacks and the clothing range already in the sort of first pass and then they had the dolls and then they had the accessories for the da -da -da, and they were like all out at the same time. So I think the days of sort of doing one thing, I mean, Mattel can afford to do it all at once. And mm -hmm. what happened with Moshi was they had a success and then because they had a success, the licensing people turn up. Licensing is fascinating. You go to the licensing show and it's people selling sleeping bags and they're the sleeping bag company and they'll go around and buy licenses, do all sorts of stuff. So you're also moving into narrative. You're moving, you're trying, is it, you're trying to create a TV show? Can you explain what that is? Um, so, I mean, it's sensible when you're creating the narrative of any sort of thing like this for kids to think about it in those terms, right. telling stories, whether it's a TV show or a comic book. At the moment, we are putting together the narrative in the TV show form because it's kind of, I think, the biggest, most complicated thing you could probably think of. Mm -hmm. I'm also really interested in a comic book. Um, but yeah, if we think about the makeys and the world of makeys in that kind of visual storytelling world, and then you can see how you might do a magazine or a comic or maybe even a story or a painting book or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that will go into the game from the get-go. And to what extent does your daughter influence what you do? Because she was, I think, early on, on the website, it says that she wanted a space pirate. Yeah. So does she continue to influence the kinds of products you create? Um, so for her, dolls are like so uncool because it's what one of her parents does. <laughs> like, I mean, she likes them, but she's, she's more into, interested in making junk bots at the moment. So she takes all of the recycling and a roll of gaffer tape and makes these huge junk bots out of yeah. rubbish, which is <laughs> awesome. I'm Sounds thinking, like God, that's pretty good, actually. Um, what could you, could you package that up? That could be Makey 3.0. Yeah, I want to exactly. ask you a couple of questions just about Tech City before we move to questions from the audience. Um, you actually had another startup, I didn't know this, oh. uh, here in East London in 2000, was it? 98 to 2002. Yeah, so you saw it before yeah. and then, you know, during the sort of Tech City Silicon Roundabout yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah. Do you sense that there's meaningful momentum in Tech City? Yeah, huge. Huge. So we had a dot-com bubble, right? And I was right in the middle of it. And the, so the startup I did last time was a Java software company doing um, entertainment-y things for uh, entertainment brands. Mm -hmm. So it was avatars, hence my love of avatars, uh, forums, live <coughs> Java chat, um, interviewing celebrities online with ch chat rooms. Do you remember that stuff? Yeah. Chat rooms and uh, I am and that kind of stuff. And basically what happened was it was a B to B. So we had clients and it was a dot-com boom and bust. So in 98, we had loads of clients coming to us and saying, can you provide us with these services? Can you come and make Harry Potter magical creature maker, that kind of thing? 
And then the other side of 2000, it started to slide as they all started to panic and take things in house. Right. Um, but around then, it was tiny. There was nobody on the streets around here. I mean, nobody. It was empty. And it did feel like a bit of a sham. Like the, the boo.com, you know, right. bust through however many millions in however many weeks. And it did feel like where it, you don't even see these people. What the hell is going on? Now it feels real really real it is real mm -hmm. like you know there are hundreds of startups around here because there's a sentiment that sometimes it, attention brings froth brings oh, it definitely distraction brings froth. yeah yeah there's no doubt about that but you feel supported and you feel you're actually getting some benefit from the other companies here the um, attention from the government yeah 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 i mean it just feels like very much part of the community uh, but it's fun going and getting your coffee and hearing somebody go, yeah, well, GitHub is doing blah, 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 behind <laughs> you. And you're like, mm, what are you doing? Um, so I'm always eavesdropping. Uh, yeah, but it's nice, you know. And then on that, there's just the walk to work. You always bump into some friendly nerds. I just want to say thanks to Alice. I'm so excited that you came here. I'm really interested to see what you do next. So oh, appreciate it.